Hi there, I'm Stephen Witt. And I'm Lauren. And this is going to be called Witty Banter. It is my first attempt, our first attempt, <laughs> at a podcast, but it's also going to be up on my YouTube channel, Invasive Wit. And I've always enjoyed podcasts where it's just people talking about stuff. And very often in our relationship, we talk about stuff that I find very interesting, like the way we talk about it. And so I thought it'd be fun for us to make a podcast and let other people enjoy our unique insight on things. So I came up with a few items to talk about because I'm the planner. For those listening to the podcast, she's giving me a dirty look. So first idea I thought of. If you could erase your memory to read a book for the first time again, which book would you choose? The reason I came up with this idea is those who know Lauren, which will be most people uh, watching and listening to this because I've found that my viewership over doubles when Lauren is involved with the video, so most of the viewers are probably the Lauren fans. Uh, for those that know Lauren, she loves reading. What's my fan name? Yeah. If I have fans, what, what, what's my fan name? <laughs> I did not think of a fan name for you. I think we need to. I think that needs to be a slight... Lauren the Librarian. No, not like, not like a... What? I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 I'm you... talking about like fans. Like fan, like when you're a fan of something, mm -hmm. you like collectively call yourself a name of that thing. So like fans of Josh Groban are the Grobanites. Oh. Uh. Or, you know, like... Harry so, Potter people are Harry Potheads, or just Potterheads, or, you know, so it's like, if you're a fan of me, what is what is our collective ship name on the internet? Not a ship name. No, that would be name. both of it. So, we're thinking of a fan name just for you? Yeah. <laughs> See, it's hard. I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, I, I did not, you know, anticipate. We can, we can come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you brought it up. You said we could dovetail. <laughs> I'm going to dovetail the heck out of this conversation. <laughs> Haven't even started the first topic and already squirrel! Mm -hmm. uh, so, I don't know. The to your point, yes, I love reading. <laughs> the priesties? I don't know. No. 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 Lauren the clergy. The, oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> so, she didn't tell her last name, but her last name is Priest. Mm -hmm. So, there you go. Your, your fandom will be the, the clergy. clergy. I like it. All right, so... Bring it back. <laughs> Lauren is an avid reader. She loves reading. And so I thought this would be an interesting... It's kind of weird how I keep referring to you both in the first and third person. I mean, you can just pick one. Or you can go back and forth. I don't care. Okay. But anyway, you <laughs> love reading and you read all the time. And so that's why I thought um, this would be an interesting question for you is, you know, so like I said, you were, you know, there's some, like, just a little pill. You pop the pill, and it's going to make you instantly forget the book of your choice. Not because you don't like the book. Mm -hmm. You know, because you know, I'm sure there are some books where you're like, I wish I never read that and could forget it. But this is so that you could re-experience that first-time read. The joy of reading that book for the first time again. Because that's something you could never have. Mm -hmm. Once you've read a book, you love that. It's one reason why I don't tend to read read re-read books is because it's hard to regain that first time feel of when you read it mm -hmm. and then when you read it again it's like well I already know what's gonna happen because I read it before you know it's kind of like when it's kind of like watching a stand-up comedian that you've already uh, video that you've already seen once you still find it funny but you're not gonna laugh as hard as you did the first time you saw it mm -hmm. so now that I have explain to death this question do you have anything in mind for a book you would like to experience reading for the first time again well let me ask you this do you have an answer to this i'm not trying to I'm not let trying me to answer your it. question with a question well no but like I, that gives me I, I think i i think i have an idea just off the top I, of my I head i guess it's fair because since i came up with these uh, hit right. points. Right, I didn't have time to think about this. This is on the fly. This is improv. I told you before we started recording, so you had a little, little bit of time. <laughs> you also had not, the opportunity to, to fair, come up with your own questions. To but be fair, not. this is a very like sacred question, yeah. and I did not have any time to ponder it. So you're going to get like a very organic, 
off the top of my brain. Which sort is of what an I was answer. going for. I want organic. That's what all the people are craving for is organic. <laughs> you see it all the way in the grocery store. Anyway. Yeah, it's going to cost you extra then. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to go up from zero to zero times two. Uh -huh. uh, I am not as avid a reader as you. Um, and so I don't read very often. So this question was fairly easy for me. And I'm getting, like, there's a chance you might already know what this is. I think I do. Because it's a book that I quite enjoyed reading for a first time. In fact, I bought this book recently mm -hmm. just for the possibility of maybe reading it for a second time because it's been around 20 years since I read it the first time. So, you know, now it's like, well, I don't remember as well as I used to, so I can kind of get that experience back. Uh, it is Catch-22. Uh, it's a book I love. I love the, like, with Catch-22, I love the way that each chapter is from the point of view of a different person. So it's like, you read a chapter in the beginning of the book that's from, you know, the person A's point of view, and then, like, ten chapters later, you re-visit uh, that scene, but from a different person's point of view. And so it allows you to connect from that. It's, it's kind of like a bunch of little mini stories that are all woven together. And as you know, I love when TV series or movie series kind of weave together and just like take aspects from each other. And so it's like, it's kind of like that, but in a book. I get that. I see that. And so, yeah, if I could, you know, relive a first read, which I kind of, kind of get to do because like I said, it's been... 20 years I remember the main concept mm -hmm. like the main plot of the book and like maybe one or two of the side plots but there are a lot of slide plots in Catch-22 I've never I, read it I want to say that's something I didn't think to ask you no I've, I've actually never read Catch-22 well now you have the opportunity since I have the book I know we have a physical copy now. yes all right so have I uh given you enough time to contemplate this yourself? I think so okay. I think so so like okay well, actually, kind of, kind of going off of what you said about me not reading Catch Twenty Two, I have an odd amount of holes in my like consumption of classic literature mm -hmm. because I like the way that my school was. There was like the standard reading classes, and then there was like the advanced. Like we didn't have AP classes when I was mm -hmm. a kid, but we had the Leap program, which was essentially like where the smart kids went. That wasn't AP, but they you know. hashtag bragging. <laughs> No, but like, no, the pro actually it was a problem. It was, it was a good thing and a bad thing because the people who were in the regular reading class read a lot of the classic literature that like you're expected to read like in middle school and high school, like The Scarlet Letter and Of Mice and Men and Grapes of Wrath and things like that. I never read any of those because I was in this other AP English course. So like, uh, but I was reading stuff like Night by Elie Wiesel and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Like I've got like a whole bunch of great classics under my belt but all of the like standard classics that you're supposed to read i never read like any of them mm. and the only classics that i ever read like in my spare time were ones that interested me personally so like dracula and <laughs> the jungle by upton sinclair and like victor hugo novels like that's what i read on my own but like all the other stuff mm -hmm. so like yeah i've never read catch 22 but i probably would have if I hadn't been in this nah, obscure... Not necessarily. So, I, when I read it, was in high school. Mm -hmm. It was uh, an option on the, like, you got to choose from various books which one you wanted to read. Mm -hmm. And so, but especially in, uh, like, late in uh, later years, it, I believe it was put on the no read list because... Oh, it was a banned book? Yeah, I believe it was oh, a banned book. Your favorite book is a banned book. Because it does talk about sex in the book and deals with, uh, you know, a lot of interesting issues. And so it's like, I think, I, you know, because it talks about sex in the book, you know, all the people are like, oh no, don't let our children know about sex. And so they put it on the ban list. I don't know if it is still on the ban list. Back when I was a substitute teacher, I saw a poster of all the books on the band list. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the teacher was kind of using that poster as a, here's all the things that we cannot let you enjoy because some people are 
you know, have a stick up their butt. But you should read them anyway. Yeah, kind of a, like a, <laughs> here's the books we can't have you read in class. We now, can't teach you if books. you want to read them on your own, we have no control over That's that. That's smart. But yeah, I, and I know for a fact that I saw Catch-22 on there, and I'm like, my favorite book is on the ban list. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't back in the early uh, 2000s, late 90s. Like, uh, I think I would have read this around probably 2001, 2002. Is what I read Catch Twenty Two somewhere in that area. Cool. Back to you. I was eleven. You're welcome. <laughs> so for those that don't know, there's roughly a six-year gap between the two of us, and anytime I mention something from back in my teen years, she likes to point out how old she was when I was a teenager. And he's still with me. Anyway, I love you. I love you, too. Okay. And now it's documented. Uh-huh. Like it wasn't before. Anyway. Uh, right. Okay. So, I feel like this book should be like a beloved classic or something, mm -hmm. like, or something from my childhood, but it's not. I'm, I think I'm going to go, like, having no prior thinking about it. I think I'm going to go with The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield. Okay. First of all, I love Diane Setterfield's books now. Mm -hmm. But when I first read The Thirteenth Tale, I was in high school, and it... I really hated it. Mm. I hated it a lot, to the point where I, like, just got viscerally angry having to... Know that knowing that I had to finish this book for school, mm -hmm. but I also was so compelled by the story and the writing that I was like incredibly excited to finish the book, and that was my first time I'd ever had like a juxtaposition of feelings while reading a book. Because normally for me, it's like either I like it, but I still want to know how it ends, so I mm -hmm. just finish it. Because I don't believe... There are two types of, of readers, I feel like, in the world. There are people who read books all the way through, regardless of whether or not they're enjoying them, because they can't stand not to finish a book. And then there are people who are like, life is way too short, and there are too many books in this world. I It's called DNFing. I'm going to DNF anything, do not finish anything, that I just do not have time for. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I respect that opinion a lot, but every time I tried to become a DNF kind of reader... I regret it because I immediately am like, well, what if the book was really good? Yeah, well, what like, if, like, the last well, quarter of yeah. the book was, like, amazing and I'll mm -hmm. never know? And, like, I, I literally, like, there was one point where I, like, had to call my parents and be like, did I leave this book with you guys, like, after I moved out? Because I'm like, mm -hmm. I bought it in college. I was like, is it back in the basement? And they're like, yes. I'm like, can I please have it? I have to know how that book ends. And they're like, okay, here's the book. Have fun. So, like, I can't, I can't DNF. So, I, obviously, this book I couldn't DNF anyway because it was for school. Mm -hmm. But it was it was so weird because I, I loved it so much, but I hated it the entire time. And I'm like, how can you possibly love and hate something simultaneously? And it was just a weird experience. So, like, I, I do have a physical copy of my own now. I have since read her other two books, that, and I love both of them. Mm -hmm. Like, I genuinely love both of them. The, uh, Bellman and Black. I, I'm thoroughly convinced Bellman and Black doesn't exist. Um, it's like, I feel like it's a fever dream. It's not, it, it's real. But like, I found it one day in a local bookshop and it was this beautiful cover. And I'm like, oh my God, Diane Setterfield, she wrote The Thirteenth Tale. That's the book I hated in high school. I should read that. And it is, it has really low ratings because it's technically the most boring concept for a book. It's about a man who works in the textile industry and he loses all of his family members, just eventually, because it takes place a long, like, long time mm -hmm. in the past. Like, just when that losing happened, yeah. people in your life was it's relatively like, common. Yeah, oh, you know, had five kids, three of them died to, uh, yeah. you know, the plague. Exactly. So, like, it wasn't that far back, but right. it was far enough that, like, illness just took your family mm -hmm. members. So he just eventually ended up being the last one in his family. And when he had lost literally everything, he's approached by this man who says, hey, I want you to go into business with me. Here's what you have to do. And that's like all we know. We don't know any details. And all of a sudden, it, it time jumps, and there's this beautiful, gorgeous funeral parlor. And, like, everything inside the funeral parlor is, like, handmade, like, and all this stuff. Basically, this guy, he strikes a deal with death, mm -hmm. is the premise. And so, like, he goes from taking all the knowledge that he learned in the textile industry and applying it to making fine 
gorgeous high-end items for rich people in the morning process. So it's not just coffins and, and like, you know, things you need, but also, like, beautiful gloves and, like, morning shawls and veil, like, all this, like, really high-end quality funeral stuff. And, like, that's the whole plot, essentially. And people are like, what on earth is this? Why are we reading this? This is boring. Because it's very slice of life, too. Mm -hmm. Like, it very much goes into the detail, like, of the textile industry. But for whatever reason, I freaking love this book. I read it in, like, October of, like, 2016 when I was going to Montreal. See, I remember it was very vividly. Yes, it very, yeah. very left an impression on me. And I loved it so much. The writing was so beautiful. And it was just so magical and captivating. But, like, anytime you go into any other bookstore, it's not there. Hmm. You'll see the 13th tale, and you'll see her next book, which is, uh, oh shoot, what's it called? Something about a river. Once Upon a River. There we go. Once Upon a River is there. 13th tale is there. Bellman and Black doesn't exist. And, like, I legitimately, like, thought for a hot minute, like, do I have, like, the only copy of this book? And is this book cursed? Like, is this a magic book that I have that no one else knows about? But then it, it's on Goodreads, so I, I know it's real. But, like, it just kind of was a magic book. Like, I've never seen it since. Ever. Wow. And I don't know if it's because it was so bad that it just is out of print and it just never is in stores anymore, mm -hmm. or if it's just a really small run. I don't know, but I've literally yeah. never seen it ever I was again. Say, yeah, my guess would be that it had a small run, didn't sell well, and they're just like, you know what? We don't want to print any more of this because we don't think we can sell more of these. Well, it's magic as heck, which is very like fitting with this author because I feel like she's very renowned, mm -hmm. um, and like people really do like The Thirteenth Tale and Once Upon a River. Not Bellman and Black. And um, her she doesn't announce when she's writing a new book. They just appear. Like, all of a sudden, there's a new Diane Setterfield. After, and there's like three years in between each book. And I'm like, is this woman magic? Like, honest to God. Like, I, I, like she just, everything about her work is like, it's just like, are, is this woman even real? Like, the whole time, I'm like, I don't even know if any of this is actually happening or if I'm just fantasizing it in my head. Yeah, you, this entire time you have been having a hallucination. Yeah, it's and not the people real. at the bookstore are like, "Why is she so interested in dictionaries?" <laughs> Every so often, she comes in here with a dictionary, <laughs> but she calls it something else, and she says it's written by this woman that doesn't even exist. Like, never heard of her, and then just starts flipping through the dictionary, and is enthralled with it. What is with this woman? Well, anyway, Diane Setterfield like basically is like she lives. The, the mood and the tone of her own novels, which I think is, that's great. That's like writer goals. So the point, the reason I want to read 13th Tale again, or get the chance to reread it again without having any prior knowledge, now, mm -hmm. as an adult, versus when I read it in high school. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, like you say, with Catch-22, it's been so long since you've read it. Like, I remember the plot yeah. of 13th Tale, but I would love to go back and read it again, clean slate, to see what my reaction would be as an adult mm -hmm. versus when I was in high school, to see if there was anything that, like, psychologically or emotionally, like, ticked me off as a, mm -hmm. as a younger person, if, like, maybe that would not affect me the same way now. They can appreciate it more. Right. Or now. would I be just as enraged but, like, still think it's the most amazing thing ever? I don't know. I find it interesting that, like, so... The per when I first created this question, to like was, relive the magic. Yeah, exactly. Relive <laughs> the enjoyment, and so. But like, I, and, and you are, but like, you are also kind of doing this like a science experiment, being like, okay, <laughs> right. where you go. Apparently, before you're taking this pill, you're going to document all of your thoughts and feelings on this book, mm -hmm. so that when you take the pill, you still have it written mm -hmm. down somewhere. Then take the pill. Document your you know new feelings and then compare the two to see if there was any difference between high school Lauren and adult Lauren. Kinda, yeah. Cause like I don't know, I I just never had that kind of a, such a strong visceral hatred for something, and yet was so unquenchably compelled to finish the thing. Like it was, mm. I was desperate to get to the end because I had to know what happened. I was so invested, but I hated it. So would you say that was, like, the hardest book you've ever had to read? Like, hardest for you to get through book? Or? Probably. Even though it was super easy to get through because I was reading it so fast. I mm. think, yeah, just, like, mentally, it was probably really... No, I'll tell you the worst book I ever read for high school oh, yeah. that I did not want to get through was Heart of Darkness. No, no idea. I can't remember the name of the author, which is bad because that's also a classic. But Heart of Darkness, dear Lord, 
that was a time. And they were, there were a lot of books that I read in high school that I just, I never DNF because I couldn't. Mm -hmm. But like ones that I'm like, why are we reading this? I remember like, the... Like Shoot the Moon. Like that one was weird. There's the other, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> uh, the hardest book I ever had to deal with was in college. And it wasn't anything to do with the enjoyment. It was Uncle Tom's Cabin. Oh, Harry so, Beecher Stowe. Uh, Gay Thick. The reason I had trouble with it, as I, uh, for those who have not watched my YouTube, go to my YouTube channel and face it away. Uh, I was at Coffee Through the No Street, and yeah. It's great. Uh, the, uh, for those that haven't seen I uh, have a dis read disability dyslexia. I can read. Some people have the misconception that people with dyslexia can't read. No, that's not true. I can read. I just read at a slower rate. And, like, I interpret the words a little bit different like the way the words go from me seeing them to me understanding them is a little bit different and uncle tom's cabin while i did like enjoy it while i was reading it all of the dialogue is written in a super thick southern accent and like mm. written how it would sound mm -hmm. and it was just so difficult for me to get through because i was like i had to stop like every two three words to figure out what word this was because i didn't recognize the word and then i'm like sounding out i'm like oh they're saying horse but the <laughs> word way you know hoss you know and then, you know so be like h-a-a-s-r like like just weirdly spelt to try to bring across the southern dialect yeah. and it just made all, all my usual tricks of like uh, to help me with my dyslexia, like predicting what word is next from you know typical English uh, grammar and stuff like that, doesn't work when it is written in a super thick Southern dialect. It's the same reason why I have trouble with uh, Shakespeare plays, mm. is because the the flow isn't the same as what I'm used to, so I can't use any of my tricks. And some of the words I don't recognize because they're words we don't really use anymore. And, but with Uncle Tom's Cabin, it was such a trudge for me because I had to... Usually it takes me longer to read some than the average person, but this took me even longer than I normally take. Well, it's like an 800-page book. Oh, yeah, it's a big book. Or more. Uh, but I actually didn't finish it. <gasps> uh, I actually... Yeah, don't tell my college professor this, but I looked at the cliff notes... <laughs> to get through the book because it was taking up literally all my free time to read this book. Not only did I not, which that's actually one reason why I stopped reading until I met this wonderful woman and kind of got back and reading it is because before uh, college, I would read for enjoyment sometimes, especially when I was a child, like elementary, middle school, I would read for enjoyment all the time. High school, I kind of stopped because so much of my time was spent doing school reading. But then when I got to college, I had to spend so much time reading that other people didn't that I'm just like, I don't have time for reading for enjoyment because I have to spend all this time reading for class. Mm -hmm. And so reading for enjoyment just kind of got pushed away. And by the time I got done with college, I basically fell out of reading for enjoyment. Oh yeah. Because to, you know, in my mind, reading was a chore and it's like okay i'm out of college i don't have to read anymore <laughs> and so it wasn't until i met you and realized how much you enjoyed reading i was like okay well this is something i'd like to do for us to do together so i got back into reading i still do it at a much much reduced consumption rate than you like in the time it took me to finish one book i think you finished like 20. <laughs> and it wasn't 20. I average about, on a good month, like if there's not too much going on, I average about a book a week. So like about a 300-page novel I can finish in about seven days. Okay, so maybe you read like 10 books in the time it took me to finish that last book. I don't think it was that many. Because uh, the only time, uh, for those wondering, the book was uh, uh, Avatar Legend of Kyoshi, I believe it's called. Or? The Rise of Kyoshi. Right, thank you. Rise By of C.B. Lee. Which I do love. I don't want you to think, because uh, I can't remember the uh, title. That's just me with a bad memory. I do love this book. I recommend uh, Rise of Kiyoshi and also uh, Shadow of Kiyoshi. Both are very good books. The first one is amazing, ex 
like it's good even if you haven't uh, watched a series, but obviously it makes more sense if you've watched Avatar: The Last Airbender. So like, you know, if you if you have seen that series and enjoyed it, you will love this book. Even if you haven't seen the series, I think you would enjoy that book. I think that's true, but I think as someone who doesn't really, who hasn't seen Avatar very often and mm. didn't watch it until like I was in college, I'm not like I know obviously the whole thing, but I I don't know a majority of it. Mm. I, I understood it and I could follow along with it but I feel like if you're an avid fan you probably would get more out of it than if you're a casual fan yeah, I, I can see that I'm a little bit biased about that but yeah and so like that, the only time I read that book I kept it at your place mm -hmm. so the only time I read it was when I was at your place which also made it so take that, longer so that narrowed your progress yeah, yeah. alright well not that I don't I imagine that we will probably talk about books in future episodes, Aww. but I, you know, no offense, I don't want this to be a book podcast. This is, you know, like I said, it just, could be. It, it very well could. Well, you know what? Maybe, maybe you could do your own book podcast I, after. I could do you that. You could, you could do this, and then your, you know, you could do your own YouTube channel. It would overshadow mine, and then I'd be begging you to mention my. <laughs> Uh, channel in yours just to get the trickle down economics of your viewership. All right, so uh, another uh, thought I had here. Actually, uh, so I'm not going to do these in the order I have them written down because oh. you made me think of one that uh, I might think is a little bit more uh, kind of ties in. You were talking about that uh, book you read where they uh, jump forward like five years or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, you already know what's coming up here. Mm -hmm. Is I would like to talk about time skips in TV and movies. Ah. So, the reason I want to talk about time skips in TV and movies is because I hate them. <laughs> I absolutely hate them. Because, like, a lot of the times they'll have important stuff happen in those time skips and try to have you f you know figure out on your own what happened or give you bits and pieces of information of what happened as it goes on and it's like why didn't you just show us that time sorry Loki alligator Loki uh, why didn't you just show us that time instead of you know shoving it in during the current time so the reason I brought this uh, up is I am a very uh, avid fan of the MCU Marvel Cinematic Universe and you know I love the series I've been watching them since Iron Man case in point um, and yeah and also if you saw the video that we did on our anniversary that's why she got me the Avengers t-shirt I love the Marvel Universe and I loved uh, both and, uh, Infinity War and Endgame. What I hated, spoilers if you have not seen Infinity War or Endgame, but I feel that the movie's been out long enough that uh, I can talk about it, is that in Endgame, you know, they have a little bit of an intro, but very early on in the movie, they're like, okay, jump forward five years, and now here's, you, know, you gotta try to piece together what happened in that five year jump from all the stuff, I forgot to turn off my phone, I don't know if the mic picked that up, all the stuff that has happened in that five year jump and the part that made me the most upset, most of the stuff was fairly simple stuff, easy to understand, like yep, life is different, uh, Tony Stark had a kid, okay, you know, it wasn't too, too major, but the part that really annoyed me was that Hulk, that Bruce Banner learned how to control Hulk. Because I loved in Infinity War how he was struggling with it and at, towards the end he's like, dude, we have to figure this thing out. And I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to see how they like explain why he wasn't coming out, how to do that. And then they're like, nah, we're not going to explain it. Five year jump, he now knows how to control it. I, I kind of... Uh, Grab the steering wheel on this one. I. I, I mean, to be fair, the last one was basically for me. That's true. That's another reason why I moved to this one because I know I have opinions. <laughs> do you have any opinions when TV and movie do time jumps? Not really. I think for me, it basically just depends on how well it's executed, and like I, I don't know. I feel like I don't get 
quite as worked up about details. It depends. On, I guess it all. I guess it depends on the thing itself too. Mm -hmm. Like if it's like you say, if it's a franchise that I'm like really really invested in, it's poorly executed. That I'm obviously going to have a lot of strong feelings. Mm -hmm. But if it's just something that I'm casually enjoying, and it can be, if it's not a hindrance to the plot or mm -hmm. the characters or anything, if it's just something that they needed to cut for time's sake, but it doesn't yeah. actually affect anything. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm fine with it. It's like okay, kind of kind of like how we in the uh, Harry Potter movies, we don't know what they do during the summer usually. Mm -hmm. It's usually not that important to the plot. Right. Or like you know. And, uh, yeah, sometimes it's just like, okay, you know, a couple months, you know, went by, not much happened, they just went about right. their lives. yeah. What I hate is when it's like, huge changes have happened, mm -hmm. and we're either not going to explain them, or we're going to explain them through exposition while the current stuff is going on. Mm -hmm. Another example I have is the TV show Young Justice. So, watch season one, I love season one, I'm like, this is great. Season two comes on, and they do like a five-year jump, or like maybe not even five years. Maybe it was only, I think it was several years. I know that. I think it might have been five, uh, but yeah, like a five-year jump, and everything changed. It's like, hey, these two aren't a couple anymore, and now these two are, and here is like fifteen new characters with no introduction to all of them, because in the first season, each character kind of got a little bit of an introduction, you know, at least a small amount. It's like, nope, here they all are, and now in order to introduce these characters, we're just going to have episodes that center around them and exposition the heck out of them. And it's just like, I would have much preferred it more is if it was, you know, these characters were introduced organically, and if we saw why did this couple break up or this couple got married and stuff like that, you know, and it's like, I got invested in these characters, and now, instead of learning their stories organically, I have to now piece together their stories while, you know, everything else is going on in this, and it's just, it drives me nuts. And then, after season two, uh, they got canceled on Nickelodeon, HBO picked them up, and then they did a two-year time jump and did exactly the same thing. And I'm just like, for crying out loud, stop doing Time like like I said, a couple of month time jump. Fine. Very little changes. Fine. It's almost like with like with this show, each time jump it almost made it an entirely new show each season. Mm -hmm. It's another reason why I don't like time travel in <laughs> a lot of T V movies because it's just like it depends once again, it depends on how it's done. But like in some T V movies it's like, okay, we time traveled, changed something in the past. Now everything in the present is different. So all that stuff that you knew from watching, you know, two or three seasons, none of it matters. Mm -hmm. All new stuff you have to figure. You know, and it's like basically starting from scratch. Yeah. It's like, you know, I, I it it would basically it's basically like in a book series if they, if you had like two or three book series and they're like, okay, we're gonna take one character that was like a side character. And now the book series is going to follow them, ignoring everything else you learned and got invested with with the previous book series. Yeah, I'd call it a spinoff. Yeah. Spinoff series. But, like, now imagine that, but instead of it being a spinoff, the main series is just, that's now what or the main com series is. companion. Right? Companion series. Yeah. Term it's like, it's not even a companion. It's just, this is now what we consider the main series. Mm -hmm. And that's what irks me. It's like, if you want to do something else, that's fine. But it's just like, if you're going to get me invested in something... Don't throw all my investments away. Investments away. I, I. That's the whole point of watching, uh, TVs or movies or reading books is to get invested in them. Mm -hmm. I will tell you. I have one really good example mm -hmm. where they did everything you said that you hate, but it was executed beautifully, and that was in the book that you got me a while back, The Bone Witch by Rin Chapeco. Mm -hmm. And that book did exactly that. So like, basically, you you have one chapter that takes place in the present. And then the next chapter takes place in the past. Okay. So you're simultaneously watching her talking to this person in the mm -hmm. present, doing whatever it is that she needs to do. And he, this other person is, like, interviewing her, like, asking her, like, okay, how did you get to this point, and what are you doing? And so to answer, she would then, it would go back in time. And so at the end of the book, it all culminates with her talking to this person, saying, so this whole, uh, the whole sequence of going backwards, we know 
who her teachers are, we know who she's in love with, we know like all these details that we know to be solidly true. And then at the very last chapter, she turns to this person who's basically interviewing her and is like, yeah. And so the person that we thought was going to be her lover is now her arch enemy, and her arch enemy is now her lover, and we have absolutely no idea why. And I literally was like, what in the name of what? Yeah. So after all this stuff you learned? All retconned. But, but yeah. But there's a whole, it's a whole trilogy. Mm -hmm. So like I have yet to read the next books in the series, but I immediately grabbed those other books in the series because so I was like, I've got to know how we got from here to here completely swapped. Mm -hmm. And so I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, but even if it's not true, even if we don't learn how this happened in the next two books, the fact that it was so shocking and so, like, I found it so engaging and rewarding, even though, it sounds like to you, that would have been really annoying. Yeah, yeah, annoying. this is my nightmare. I thought it was amazing, because I'm like, wait, what? How did we get here? I need to know. So, like, yeah, I don't know for a fact if we learn, but since there's two giant, you know, 400-page books in the series, I'm assuming at some point we're going to learn how we got to this point. But I thought it was awesome, so... Probably should have opened this soda before we started recording. You know, I, I was no going to say that, but I'm like, yeah. don't don't draw attention to it. Just let <laughs> it happen. And I, now I'm doing the exact thing and drawing attention to it because I have no idea if it's speaking on the mic. But those of us watching on YouTube will see me very slowly opening this, like very meticulously trying to make it so that it doesn't get picked up on the mic, which of course I am now bringing huge attention to. Uh-huh. Well done. It's fine. All right. So, So I think to answer your previous question, I don't think time jumps bother me nearly as much as they bother you. Yeah, this, this seems to be... I'm, I'm sure there are others out there like me. We can maybe make a support group called, <laughs> you know, Just Tell the Effing Story. Uh, but, yeah. You're right, though. Like, I mean, I feel like it's a really good, like, um, cop-out mm -hmm. for people who, especially if, like, if stories, like, change, like franchises change hands or companies... Yeah. Like, if they want to just completely yeah, like, do uh, their own thing, clean slate. For example of that, you know, uh, the Doug Funny TV show. Mm -hmm. when it was, it was on Nickelodeon, and then Disney bought it from them. And they're like, okay, it's ours now. Uh, we want to change a bunch of stuff, though. So he went through summer, and all these changes happened during that summer. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's just like... And, yeah, I, I got, like I said, I, I dislike it when... Like, when I saw that HBO had brought up Young Justice, I'm like, great, because I finally, after watching through season two, got back to the investment point I was at in season one, and so I'm like, okay, now I'm back on board, I'm now invested in these characters, and all these other characters, they've got me back on, oh, it's canceled, oh no, and then HBO picked up, I'm like, great, then you can continue on where they left off, no, another time jump, everything's different, and now... There, oh, oh, this is a, so, you know, I told you about how this is going to uh, switch up another other subject. Mm -hmm. Another thing I extremely hate is when they take something that has humor in it and oh. then decide, no, we need to be grittier and more serious and draw all the humor out of it. And that's what they did with this Young Justice when it went to HBO. It's almost all the humor was taken out of it to be more adult and edgy. And you know that I have the same feeling when it comes to the live-action Disney remakes, mm -hmm. where just like, and I understand the, you know, some of the jokes that are in the animated movie won't work in live action, but they take so they gotta take those jokes out, but they don't replace it with new jokes, and so it's just not as enjoyable because it's not as funny. Uh, my one of my uh, best examples is. The Aladdin movies. Mm. Aladdin is one of my favorite movies. Uh, I love Robin Williams. He is my favorite comedian of all time. You know, huge Robin Williams fan. And he, you know, and when I when I heard they were making a remake, I was like, no, no one else can be a genie except Robin Williams. And they're like, Will Smith's gonna do it. Okay, I'm interested to see how he takes it. And he he did a good job. He made it his own. He did a good job. But one my Roman back around here. My example of them taking out comedy was Iago. Mm -hmm. Iago was a great source of comedy in the original Aladdin. And in the live action remake, 
They just made him a typical parrot that repeats words and doesn't really add anything to the movie. And it's just like, so all that fun stuff with Iago is now gone and nothing's replacing it. Mm -hmm. And same thing with Abu. Abu was not as fun because you don't have the facial expressions that you would in a animated series. Understandable. But he kind of didn't really matter much to the story either. And it's just like, it, it basically it focuses entirely on uh, Jasmine and Aladdin. It's like, okay, let's add more to their stuff. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, add more to their stuff. Can you add some more humor while you're at it too? Since you, since the since the empty space was humor taken out, could you put humor in? No, no, just relationship stuff and character. Yeah, but no humor, no humor at all. Same thing with Jungle Book. Same thing with. Uh, uh, Beauty and the Beast. You know that one didn't do it. That, that one did a little bit I better liked job. Beauty and the Beast. It, it did a better job, but I know I, feel, I shouldn't, but like I actually like that one. Yeah, because that they did add a few things in there mm -hmm. that were comedy. Mm -hmm. So that's why they did better. But I don't. I still didn't like it. Like it still didn't quite. Yeah. Made it. The only one that I felt did a very good job, which is funny, because in recent years it's been very popular for Disney to do live action remakes of their. Uh, Renaissance movies, you know, the ones in the 90s. And the only one that I actually enjoy was made, like, in the early 2000s, which was 101 Dalmatians. Oh, yeah. That's the only live-action remake I enjoy. Because, once again, you couldn't do a lot of the dog jokes because for, the dogs weren't talking, so all the dog jokes were gone, but they replaced it with other humor. Mm -hmm. And, they did, like I said, they did a great job of it. And it's like, a lot of these new live-action remakes... They take out the humor and they just put in filler or drama or something like that. It's like, these are supposed to be funny. They're supposed to be enjoyable. You can have drama in it, yes, but make sure there's comedy. Well, it's like what, like every CW show ever right now. Because mm. like my favorite example of that is Riverdale. So like it's based off of the Jughead and Archie and Veronica, like mm -hmm. th those comics, which I maybe I'm wrong, but I always thought those were just like lighthearted yeah. and fun. Yeah. But, but like, when I first heard about Riverdale, everyone's like, oh, that show's so edgy, it's so dark, it's so good. And I'm like, I thought it was based on Archie. Yeah. Archie is dark? I'm I'm very confused. They did a similar thing with uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Oh, I, yeah. So it was like, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, I'm a punk, you know, like, fun, like, oh, get into, you know weird sticky situations because of my powers but it's still okay because it's all fun and stuff like that and then it's just like no nope. we're gonna we're gonna bring it back oh hey that's cool we're gonna do kind of the modern age thing you know stuff like that nope just make it dark and edgy i mean like sabrina is like as dark as you can possibly yeah. go yeah that 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 is like horror film i dark now. i love chilling adventures of sabrina but like in terms of an adaptation yeah it's like it's it's like it's awful it it's feels, like this is not sabrina the yeah, teenage witch it feels to all. me like they just took a story that had to do with witches and they're like okay how can we make sure people will watch this i know we'll make the witch sabrina this has nothing to do with the TV show other than they're both witches. Doesn't matter. Well, and same thing with Salem. Like, in, in mm -hmm. Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, Salem is a demon that she, like, has to, you know, keep as her familiar, but mm -hmm. he chooses to look like a black cat. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't speak. He doesn't do any of his, like, one-liners from, like, yeah. the 90s, 2000s version. Like, he, he's just there. Mm -hmm. And even then, he's not really there. He's only in season one. I don't think we ever see Salem after season one. So like, see, yeah, that's that's why I never about, watched like, it because I'm just like, I I I'm not against remakes. Some remakes can you know, be good, some are bad, but when it's a remake that has almost nothing to do with the original except one small aspect, mm -hmm. then it's just like, why why did you even bother remaking this? Right, because it's a really you, good show. Yeah, but it has like, nothing to do with I, it's, it's. Yeah, like to me that taints the show. Yeah, and it's like. I would enjoy this more if you just didn't involve the Sabrina thing, just made this about a, a, you know, a lady witch and what she's going to and something like that. The other beef with Sabrina is they always used to release her new seasons in, like, July or, like, June. And I'm like, I literally will never watch this show unless it is October. Like, it is such a mm -hmm. Halloween, spooky, scary show that I'm like, I'm not going to watch the latest season of Sabrina in the summer. 
Like, that's dumb. I don't know if that was, like, because it was, like, get, losing popularity and they just wanted to yeah. get it out. I don't know. I don't know what their reasoning for that was, but that was, in my opinion, Netflix made a marketing mistake on that one. I don't understand. Yeah, I never watched this show, but, like, I have heard of it. And, like, like you, I heard it was dark and stuff it's like that. It's terrifying. Like, it is so creepy. I, I'm, not, I'm not a horror person either. I, I yeah. think I only like horror if Netflix does it. Because I like Stranger <laughs> Things and I like Sabrina, but, like, anything else, I'm like, nah... No, I'm good. And <laughs> I, as it's pre- pretty obvious with my uh, gripe against the live action Disney stuff, I'm a comedy fan. Yes. I'm okay if there's drama in the comedy. Uh, like, what was that movie I had you watched that uh, was a comedy but also a drama recently here? Uh, Something about Nicolas Cage protecting the first lady? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> now I can't think. It's something Jess, like watching Jess or something like that. But yeah, it's just like, it's, you know, it's about Nicolas Cage and he's a Secret Service person and he has to watch the former First Lady who is a complete, uh, like, she's kind of recluse herself and she's making his life a living hell. And it's like, I, I enjoy that movie immensely and during part of it, you're like, you're watching it and you're like, you said this was a comedy. <laughs> I'm like, it's a comedy drama. It's a uh, dramedy. It's a dramedy. And it's just like, that's how I'd like my dramas, with some comedy. Well, even, even the humor in that, though, was pretty, mm-hmm. like... Yeah, it was low-key humor. Played straight, yeah. yeah. Like, very dry, like, which is good. Like, mm-hmm. I appreciate that. But, like, it was very subtle yeah, for you. you. For your taste in comedy, I thought it was very subtle of a comedy. I have a wide range of comedy. That's a true. plethora of enjoyment. Speaking of um, Disney remakes, though, mm-hmm. I have, I have a, a question to pose to you. Ooh, uh, you have a question for me. Okay. Yes. Oh, heck, don't need this. Okay. Well, no, not this. It's, it's not a huge thing. I just, because we both general, generally don't care for the Disney remakes, mm-hmm. I want to know your opinion. If they were to do a live action remake of Hunchback of Notre Dame, what would you say? Because I know what I would say. I want to know what you would say. Well, chances are it would probably, I think if they did a live action remake, it would probably be terrible because once again, uh, they, you know, like they would probably, you know, they'd have to do the gargoyles in that weird Rocky CG thing, which I imagine would take away. If the gargoyles are in it at all. Yeah, that too. Like, they, <laughs> like yeah, like with Iago, they could have just taken it out. I feel the, I feel the gargoyles kind of have to be in it to, uh, be, you know, to be a Disney remake. Because I know that, you know, it's different from the uh, actual performance, but it's like I feel I feel they could they would introduce that. I feel they would like probably take out most of the comedy from the gargoyles though mm-hmm. to put in other stuff. I also imagine that they would try they would probably do what they did with Jasmine, be like we're gonna make her more of a strong you know. Well, to be fair, Esmeralda's like, already pretty yeah, badass. Yeah, and, and, and same with Jan- <laughs> Princess Jasmine in the original. Mm-hmm. But, like, like that was a thing, too, that I hated in uh, the Aladdin remake is one of her songs is like, I'm not going to stay silent anymore. It's like, you haven't stayed silent this entire movie. You have made your opinions known this entire movie. At what point were you staying silent? Like, it's a great song about woman empowerment, but it's like, that would have been, you know, if you were holding things back and not saying anything, and then suddenly you're like, no, no more, I'm going to speak my mind, then that would have been a much more impactful song, but it's like, you've been speaking your mind this entire movie, and now you're singing a song about how you're not holding back anymore, it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, you were holding back? <laughs> like, you know, what, what were you holding back, hitting them over a head with a baseball bat, what? And so, like, I imagine they'll do something like that for Esmeralda 2, which is like, once again, you don't need to because in the original, she was a strong, powerful female lead. And it's like, but they'll probably try to try to put more strength into her and in doing so, basically make her look less powerful because it's just like, you can t- tell by watching it that they're not doing this naturally. They're doing this to try to make a point. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't, and also like, I don't know how they would handle like how they portray Quasimodo because like in the uh, animated version, you can make him look really messed up, but they might do the uh, what I call the Spider-Man thing 
where they get a hot, you know, a hot actor to play, you know, it's like, he's supposed to be this nerdy, secluded guy, but you get this uh, pretty boy, you know, the Amazing Spider-Man thing, you get this pretty boy to play him, and it's like, I'm sorry, you're supposed to be the reclusive nerd that everyone ignores and no one pays attention to, but you look like you should be on a girl, like teenage girls magazine, like look at this hunky hottie thing. It's like, no, that don't fit. So I, I would love if they could do it well, but you know, I am a strong believer in learning from history and history has shown us that Disney can not do a live action remake well. 101 Dalmatians was the exception and that was like back before they started doing this as a trend. Yeah. They did it then and then they stopped doing it and now they're like bringing it back but doing it wrong. How would you think, what would you think if they decided to do a remake? For, for some context, by the way, uh, we both agree, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame is both of our favorite Disney movie. Mm -hmm. Like, when we first started talking before uh, and getting to know each other before actually going out, that was one of the things we started talking about was how we both love it, both lo like the art, the music, it is just a wonderful, beautiful movie that we both feel is underappreciated. Now bring it back to you. Mm -hmm. How would you feel if they were doing a live-action remake of Disney? Well, I agree with you. I don't trust them enough to do it well. Mm -hmm. However, 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 I am fully supportive of it. Mm -hmm. One, because it would bring, as we saw last night on Disney+, Plus. Shippendale Rescue Rangers. Ooh. The live action film is awful. Terrible. However, guess what was in the recently like trending on Disney Plus Q? Was it Chip the original, original Chippendale Rescue Rangers? Because everybody watched the new one and went, well, this was bad. What was the other one like? Or, oh no, I missed the good one. I'm going to watch it. So, do you see where I'm going with this? You want them to make a remake, regardless of if it is good or bad, just so. The modern, you know, the new generations can get reintroduced to the original. Exactly. It'll put Hunchback back in the public consciousness. You basically wanted to do the new Coke method. Kinda. Yeah. For younger viewers who might not know this, uh, when did, <laughs> was that in the 70s or the 80s? I, well, anyway, I do not know. I don't know either. I want to uh, say 70s. I think it was done in the 70s. As all of our Co parents are like, no, you're yeah. absolutely yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, all, all, all the baby boomers are like, how can you not know? This happened in 19 blah blah blah. Uh, there's, there's another spit take. That's two for the recording. Keep going, keep going. Uh, Coca-Cola came out with this new version of coca and called it New Coca-Cola, and everybody hated it. And it was a massive flop. I've never tried it, so I don't know if it's. I, I don't. I don't like Coca Cola to begin with, so I don't know if it was better or worse than the original Coca Cola. But then, when they stopped making it, they brought back the original Coca Cola, calling it Coca Cola Classic, which shot through the roof because everyone's like, "Yes, they brought back the thing we love." So you kind of want to do a new Coca Cola yeah, thing? It's like I make wanted, people appreciate the original by bringing out something terrible. Well, and even so, like even like I, I do kind of stand the idea that any kind of publicity is good publicity. Mm -hmm. So like even if the movie was terrible, like again, it would get it relevant again. It would get people talking again. There might be some crazy oddballs like me. Like I probably as a teenager, if they made a terrible live action, probably would have loved it no matter what. Right? Because I was a fan of the original, so like I probably would fall in love with this movie even if it was terrible on principle. Mm -hmm. So like I'm sure there's a lot of like younger like tween people that would probably like it just even if it is an objectively bad movie. They're, they'd find something in it to love. Mm -hmm. So you'd like rekindle those kinds of kids. And like, I don't know, I just don't see a downside. And the other thing I would like about it too, potentially, like you say, if they did it well, is since they are such fans of changing everything up, mm -hmm. If they could just go back to the original source material, aka the novel, mm -hmm. I would love it if they reintroduced, well not even reintroduced because they never even put him in the first place, I would love it if they, if they added something, took the character of Pierre Gringoire from the book and put him into a live action story. Because 
Pierre is amazing. I, I love Pierre so much. And he's not in the, the, the Disney one, obviously. But what they kind of did with his character was they broke him up between uh, Victor, the gargoyle Victor, the one yeah. who's so smart and eloquent. Like, yes. that's basically Pierre. Okay. Like, that pretentious kind of, you know, like, mm -hmm. I'm the academic, I yes. know everything. Yes, yes. Because, like, Pierre is a playwright who is one of the few people in the Middle Ages who can read and write. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, he thinks he's pretty hot stuff. And so he's writing all of these plays to be put on for the public, and none of the public understands any of it because they don't know any history. They don't know any mythology or religion, any of it. So, like, it's this really, like, high, pretentious, esoteric play to begin with, but then you put it in front of a whole bunch of people who have zero idea of anything. So, like, they think he's a terrible playwright, mm -hmm. which, objectively, he might be. Like, the whole goal, the brilliance of Hugo's writing is we don't actually know if Pierre's a good playwright or not. Mm -hmm. Because we see it through the eye of the common people, and we see it through his eyes, mm. the arrogant, pretentious person of who, of course, thinks he's the best thing ever. So, like, we don't actually know if Pierre is talented. We do know that Claude Frollo likes him, mm -hmm. and, like, they have a lot to gab about because they're both men of, of education in the Middle Ages. So, like, he's clearly talented enough to be of an equal social standing with Claude Frollo. Mm -hmm. So, you can do with that what you will. Basically, but he's an idiot. The reason I love Pierre is even if he is brilliant, he's still an idiot, and I love him. And he just needs to be in a remake, because he's in other versions, other iterations of, of the Hunchback story. But I just want him to be in the Disney version so bad. But again, that's giving them credit mm -hmm. if they would actually do it right. But if they did, and they did that for me, I would forgive them no matter how objectively bad the movie was, because then Pierre Grégoire would be a Disney prince-esque mm. thing, and I'm here for it. Now here's a question. <laughs> what would you think if, so, if they did a, uh, like, animated series of Hunchback of Notre Dame? So, like, no! back, in, back in the 90s, it was very common for movies to get cartoon series. Like, Aladdin had his own animated series. Hercules had his own animated series. Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid had their, her own Emperor animated Cusco. series. Yep, Emperor Cusco. Uh, had his own, and like, uh, Lilo and Stitch yeah. had their own animated series. Like, they had like three. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, well, there's three movies, but yeah, it was one well, animated season. I thought they had like two or two different animated, well, whatever. But yeah, like, yeah, like lots of movies back in the, like, 90s to early 2000s. Like, the movie would come out, and then it would get an animated series. Hunchback was not one of them. Thank God. What would you... Yeah, like, so I take it you wouldn't like it if they decided... No! Okay, here... Okay, there's so much wrong with this. First of all... Okay, first of all, can we say Hunchback 2? Yeah. Because that's what it would be. Second of all, it's one story. Like, it's one novel, it's one story. It's not meant to be serial. It's meant to be, like, one telling... Well, neither, neither was Aladdin or Hercules. Hercules. Well, those shouldn't have happened either. No. Her, oh, another one I forgot. Tarzan. He also got an animated series. Also should not have happened. Because yeah. like the Tarzan one wasn't as bad. Because it's like okay, this is what happens after James decides to stay. Right. Sure. And with the Aladdin, the Aladdin one took place after the second Aladdin movie, which was funny because there were a lot of people who didn't watch the second Aladdin movie. So like it would be like they're like, why is Iago now with Aladdin? That makes no sense. Honestly, I think I started watching the animated series before I saw the second Aladdin movie, which is something I was a little confused on. And then I'm like, watch the second Aladdin movie, I'm like, oh, that's why Yago's there. But yeah, so like, it takes place after that. The Hercules one is the one I take issue with. Because what that one does is it's like, okay, we're going to show the time between. So once again, hey, bringing it back to the previous stuff. Time jump in Hercules, though in Hercules, and that this time jump I didn't mind. So in the Hercules movie, where it's like, okay, we're doing a, you know, it's our training montage thing, and so we kind of jump forward to him being big and strong. Okay, that makes sense. We need to get to the point where he's actually doing the heroic stuff, and not much is happening. Really, like not much uh, appears to happen in that, other than he trains and gets big and strong. But then this is like, no, we're gonna tell those years from between when he was a little kid, scrawny kid to when it becomes a big, strong hero. And we're, you know, basically, it's like Hercules in high school. <laughs> and that, that was the present, like the very first episode. was like, hey, you have to send my kid to school. He needs to be smart. And the thing I have really taken issue with 
is that Hades shows up in the animated series. Mm -hmm. And interact like he is a con he's in almost every episode. Mm -hmm. Almost every single episode involves Hades in some way or fashion. Uh not not all of them, but I would say over seventy percent of them involve Hades. And it's like, wait a minute, in the movie when Hercules comes and starts doing his hero stuff, Hades is like, wait a minute, Hercules, isn't he supposed to be dead? And it's like, wait, if the animated series is supposed to tie in with the movie, he already knows that Hercules is like, like, that's the issue I had, is that the animated series is like, yeah, this ties in with the movie. Yeah, except that in the movie, Hades didn't know Hercules was still alive until he was an adult, and here he is interacting with him, and at no point during the animated series, I've watched the entire run, do he explain why Hades no longer remembers him. They could have. There, you know, like, and I'm sure there are people who are huge Hercules animated fans. I know they're pro they're fans of everything, so there's gotta be people who are fans of this and done their own theories on it. In that TV show, there was the pool of forgetfulness, mm. which could make you forget stuff. So maybe they could do that, but they never did that. They never been like, okay, we got to end the series. We're going to do this so it makes sense with the movie. And it's just like, but no, we're just going to say, eh, screw it. It don't make sense in the movie. We do what we want. Bet you didn't expect I was going to go on this kind of a squirrel. No, I didn't. But, yeah, no, I, I'm adamantly against animated series of mm. any kind. But, again, live-action remake is fine because it is still one contained package of a story and not a serial continuation mm. of something, slice of life, that we don't need. <laughs> All right. I think we can do one more here, unless you have a, you know, you brought this one up, do you have any other? No, okay. no, I just want to see what you'd say, because I, yeah. I've had this opinion for a while, and I just didn't know how you would feel about it. And like I said, that's why I wanted to do this podcast, because <laughs> in our relationship, sometimes we would just, we'll just sit on the couch and start talking back and forth about various weird stuff, and I'm like, we should be recording this, because this is so entertaining, and like, I'm, I'm in on the conversation, and I want to be outside watching this conversation. Alright, if you want to, you can pick the next one of, uh, so these are the three that uh, haven't done yet, is there any, I mean, this one kind of dovetails into or what we yeah. just brought up, we want to talk about that one. Yeah, or, that works. Alright, so, next up, we have Pixar movies going straight to Disney+. Plus. <laughs> so, on one aspect, I like this purely for personal selfish reasons, mm. of I get to experience the movie for the first time in the comfort of my own home without having to worry about other people talking or making noise or getting up in front of me or little kids and stuff like that. Like, I can just enjoy it in the comfort of my own home. Like, the main reason I go out to watch uh, the Marvel movies in theater is not to see them on the big screen, which, while it is enjoyable, that's not the reason I go, it's because I want to see it as soon as possible. But with the Pixar going movies going straight to Disney Plus, that you can enjoy them in the comfort of your own home as soon as they come out. But I'm sure you know why I put this on the list. Is that I know why I would. Is that it feels like like both uh, Turning Red and uh, <laughs> that was not on purpose. For those listening, Lauren is wearing a Turning Red shirt. Uh, so, Turning Red and Soul and Luca, too, also, all three of these were put out on Disney+. Plus. Now, with Soul, that made sense because they we're not releasing anything in theaters and at the time. And Onward a little bit, too. Kind of. Yeah. But Onward, what that one, to me, doesn't count because mm -hmm. Onward had hit the movie theaters, like, a couple of weeks right before the Panini yes. started. So... As a treat to the world, because it was a panini, mm -hmm. Disney said, hey, this is awful. We all need to be happier mm -hmm. in these trying times. Yep. Here's Onward, free of charge, on Disney+, Plus, mm -hmm. so everybody could access it. Yep. So that one I thought was really cool. Yeah. And it's just like, but it feels like now that we are back in theaters, they're still releasing them. So Turning Red 
was never released in theaters, went straight to Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. And there were other Disney movies that were held back so they could get theatrical release rather than be uh, Black Widow, for example, was held back for a long time. It was supposed to be released shortly after the pandemic happened. And it's just like, they like, nope, nope, we're gonna hold this back. We are, you know, we are going to change other stuff in our plans just so it makes sense when we do release stuff like that. But it's just like, with Pixar, they're like, nah, we're just gonna put that straight to Disney Plus. And it feels a little bit like an insult to the Pixar movies. Mm -hmm. Cause it's like they're saying, you, we don't want to spend the time and effort it would take to have a uh, the theatrical release. And one of the uh, issues I have with this is that Encanto did get a theatrical release. Mm -hmm. So did Raya and the Last Dragon. And yeah, Raya and the Last Dragon. And I would say that Turning Red is better than Raya and the Last Dragon. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly, but I'm biased, so... Now, I... I am also, you know, I would say... I think the Turning Red and Encanto are actually, like, two good ones to yeah. edge against it's, it's, each yeah, other. Yeah, there you go, yeah. Because like, they have such similar, like, themes yeah. and... and Like, they are both brilliant movies. Yeah, they're both great right. movies. I personally prefer Encanto. Mm -hmm. It's one, like, I when I came out to Disney, I watched it, like, several times over and over again, which I usually don't do with movies. And so I love Encanto... And, and I personally prefer Turning, turning red, red, but that's not because Encanto. Mm -hmm. I love Encanto, too. Like, I gladly yeah. watched it with you. Whenever you turn it on, I was like, okay. Yep. Because I genuinely love Encanto. And you, I think you genuinely like Turning oh, yeah. Red. Yeah, I genuinely like so, Turning like, Red, too. So, like, it's literally just a, a, a difference yeah. of Do opinion. I, yeah, I get, so, like, I give uh, Encanto an A and Turning Red an A-. minus. Right. You give an uh, Encanto an A- minus and Turning Red an A. So, it's yeah, like, and it's they're both getting awesome personal. grades. It's just... The small little bit of I you know personal preference, but yeah, like both are on par movies. But Encanto got a theatrical release, and Turning Red did it. And I, I I have a fear that this is going to kind of be the thing going forward. And I feel like the only reason that the Buzz Lightyear movie is getting a theatrical release is because they know people like Toy Story. So okay, but anything that they are not sure on is a sure thing with Pixar I feel that are going to be you know any new Pixar stuff I feel is going to get straight to Disney Plus which is really in a way a good thing because again mm -hmm. like you said immediate yep. access and I, I have no qualm about that but like you say when it comes to theatrical releases all of the artists and people who work behind the scenes mm -hmm. on Pixar work just as hard as yep. the animators at Disney and all the filmmakers at Disney so a lot of those people have stated that to them it just kind of feels like a slap in the face yeah. because it's like you're going to give these people this really awesome opportunity, but you're not mm -hmm. going to give us the opportunity. And the other reason why I think you're right, it's such a shame and it could be a, a potential like danger to the mm -hmm. industry of Pixar is that Pixar, because they are technically their own separate company, even though Disney owns, owns them. them, they are allowed to be a little more envelope pushy yeah. than Disney is. Yeah, and so a few more risks. Right. So you have amazing, like you have diversity of um, ethnicity in storytelling, like both mm -hmm. the staff of Turning Red and like the filmmakers themselves and the characters depicted. You have Spar uh, Pixar Spark shorts where you have uh, topics of neurodivergency. You have topics of the LGBTQ community. You have all these different... Well, hell, they even have one about you know, dog breeds that aren't mean, but people make them mean. Yep. Like, themes of, like, you know, things that most people mm. wouldn't... Topics that most people would not be allowed to explore had they been working in a different environment or studio. So, again, Pixar is experimental. Disney doesn't know if mm. the risk is worth taking. But as we've clearly seen mm -hmm. with all of these films, like, Pixar's yeah. had its ups and downs, but... Mm -hmm. I personally gravitate to Pixar movies way more than I do Disney. Mm -hmm. And I love Disney. I've always yeah. loved Disney. But, like, I, if you ask me, well, nine times out of ten, yeah. if you say, what do you want to watch tonight? If we're in Disney Plus, mm -hmm. I pick a Pixar movie. Do yep. I not? Because yeah. they, they resonate the most with me personally. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are a lot of people who really just genuinely love Pixar yeah. for what it is. And, like I say, they're the ones that are taking the risks. And I say taking risks. Actually having, <laughs> you know, decent 
inclusion and giving yeah. people the opportunity to tell their stories people who might not otherwise have the platform needed to tell those stories mm -hmm. they're doing the bare minimum for this kind of inclusivity and yet they're the ones that are getting shunned saying mm -hmm. no 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 we're not going to laud you for your achievements yeah. we're going to just uh you know yeah. punt you over to streaming and yeah. we're gonna have our studio stuff mm -hmm. on the big screen and have all the fun it's and like, applause also like they would make money with theatrical releases of Pixar movies. Right. There's, like, that's the part I don't understand either is, so, fun fact, Disney doesn't make most of their money through the actual uh, sales and uh, of uh, the movies. Most of the Disney company's money comes from the theme parks. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, Disney... Like everyone thinks of Disney as a movie, a uh, business that has theme parks, but in reality, Disney is a theme park business that does movies, and the movies add to their theme parks. So it's like they, you know, like the amount of their profits are dependent on how the movies sell is far less than the amount of their profits on the theme parks, which is why. They can often do riskier stuff and try different things. It's like, oh, this didn't work out, and like we made our money back, but it wasn't as huge success as we wanted to. That's still okay because now we're going to add that to the theme park, and we're going to get so many people coming to come see that new thing that that's where we're actually going to make our money in. Yeah, and it's just like it so can't you, hurt. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're not going to lose money, especially with how much their costs have gone down through computer animation. I know you have stated in the past that uh, you wish that they would have kept their uh, hand-drawn animated studio alive oh, yeah. because you miss the beauty of those hand-drawn movies. But as a person that often looks at cost-reward stuff, I know they're never going to go back to that because it costs so much more. Which I to understand, make it, but yeah. like you have to do the conceptual art anyway, and sometimes they do do traditional media. Mm -hmm. And like if you watch the end credit scenes of Luca, like the little this little animation, not well, animation, little pictures while mm -hmm. you're watching the credits, like if they would have done the entire movie in that art style, I swear to Bob, it would have been even more beautiful, and that movie was already stunning to begin with. Yeah. But like I feel like some stories just art styles specifically, mm -hmm. like art styles that studios choose, I just feel like they would lend themselves so much better if they were to be done in a traditional animation format as opposed to a computer-generated one. Mm -hmm. But that's just, I understand. I understand the practicality of that, but I'm just saying, Luca would have been so much better in 2D animation. I'm standing by it. Fight All me. Right. Yeah. I'm here for it. And All then, of course, I feel like Turning Red is also kind of a... We can't really use mm -hmm. this example because Turning Red has its own whole like mm -hmm. history and scandal behind it yeah. as, as to why it was not a success. So, like, maybe that's a bad example to use. But the, the paper trail speaks for itself yeah. with Soul, with... Uh, what else was there? Uh, Luca. Luca and Turning Red. I think yeah. it was Soul and Luca and kind of Onward. Kind of on, onward I don't really count because, like you said, right, was that was the movie that came out. That came, it did get a theatrical release. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's why I don't count it because it's like... It was didn't... the last movie I saw in theaters. Wow. Oh. Before the Panini. Yeah, I saw Onward. Yeah. And then but, yeah, like, like that... Uh, I don't count that because they didn't push that to Disney+. Plus. No, it wasn't forced on for, Disney+. Plus. You know, because they didn't want to do a theatrical release, they got the theatrical release. Oh, well, you know the other then, thing that gets me, though, is like, that? okay, so like, the reason I think it bugs me, too, is not so much the directly, like, not the theatrical release and just being kicked over to Disney+. Plus. I think the reason it irks me the most is that when they do movies like the live-action Mulan mm -hmm. or Cruella, those movies also, I mean, Cruella might have gotten a movie release theaters, but I, even mm -hmm. if they didn't, those Mulan didn't. Mulan for yeah. sure just went straight to Disney Plus, but it was thirty dollars. Yep, you had to pay for it. You had to pay thirty dollars to yep. get a month. Like you had it like for what, like two months or something. So you, I think you, I think if you paid for the Mulan, you basically had it 
for a long, long time. Like, like you just permanently had it, and then like eventually it'd be out for free. Right. But like, yeah, like you can so watch like, it as many times as you want. It's like buying a DVD. That's the other problem too. It's like it's okay if you go straight to Disney Plus, but Turning Red and the other Pixar movies mm-hmm. didn't get that. They just came on Disney Plus for free. Yep. But every Disney movie that did not have a theatrical release went straight to Disney Plus. But you got to pay an extra mm-hmm. fee if you wanted to see it in a timely manner and not wait for it to come mm-hmm. on the streaming service for free. So, so that's the other issue. Mm-hmm. So Cruella, I remember, did get a theatrical release because I remember I watched mm-hmm. Cruella in oh, the yeah, theaters. Did. Remember, it did. But you and I were going to watch uh, Eternals, I believe it was. Yeah. And I had the day off, and I saw that Cruella was showing. So I was like, Oh, I'll watch Cruella first. Then I'll watch Eternals with her. That was a good day for you. Wasn't yeah, it? That, was, that was an awesome day. I loved Cruella. It <laughs> was a good movie. But yeah. But Cruella also, you could, you know, like it had a theatrical release, but you could also watch it on Disney Plus if you pay for thirty dollars. And yeah, it's just like why, why, why do we gotta pay for these new movies, but, but not, not for those Soul, movies? Luca, and Turning Red. Yeah. Yikes. I don't know. I think they kind of stopped doing the pay thing though, because I think they got a lot of bad press for that. Well, yeah, they probably did. Yeah, like a lot of people didn't like the idea of wait, I'm paying for the streaming sir. Like, and another fee to watch this I got, movie. Yeah, to watch this movie. I like. I don't mind the idea of we'll have the theatrical release. Once the theatrical release is over, then it's on Disney Plus. Sure. I'm fine with that idea. Well, that's no different but, than like you say, waiting for it to come on to VHS and DVD yeah, back exactly. in the old days. Like that's the just old days. the old days. Well, you know, people don't know what VHSs are now. Nope. <laughs> but yeah, like that's no different than back in the day. So yeah. that I understand. Exactly. It's but... just like I, we're in this weird uh, transition stage where companies don't really know what they want to do with the streaming services. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it used to be just Netflix yeah. and Hulu. Those were like your that two options. Yeah, yeah that Netflix was it. and Hulu. That was it. And then all the big boys were like, okay, we'll let you use our stuff and kind of use you as guinea pigs to see how it goes, which shot those guys through the roof because everyone's like, I get to see Disney movies whenever I want. And so then, like, the Disney... Well, and Disney owns so much now. Yeah. You don't only get Disney, but you, you got access bucks. to almost everything. Yeah. And it's just like, then they're like, oh, this is about... Okay, now we're going to do our own thing. But like I said, they're still trying to figure out what they're doing with that streaming service. So in conclusion, Turning Red deserved better. Yes. Uh, it got way more backlash than it ever deserved. Uh, <laughs> and it should have gotten a theatrical release. Yeah. You heard it here first, folks. That's not true. I don't you think I heard it You probably heard it they, somewhere else. I'm about to say, I, I, I know <laughs> that many more people have had these kind of opinions about Turning Red before us. We're kind of latecomers to this uh, party. Maybe in future uh, episodes we can talk about more you know, stuff as they come out. I do plan on doing more episodes. Like I said, uh, I just have conversations with you that I find really interesting. And like I feel that both of us are very good at playing devil's advocate. So like when I bring up a topic, you like to point out different thoughts that even if they're not thoughts that you personally feel are things to consider and I often do the same for you when it's stuff that you enjoy and you're talking about this I was like oh what did you think about it at this angle or at this angle or at this angle <laughs> for those listening on the podcast I'm doing funny hand gestures if you'd like to see these funny hand gestures you can watch my uh, this video and others on uh, my YouTube channel invasive wit Transitioning, I feel I feel this is a good place to end the first episode. That We've was been smooth. going for a while, so we we'll transition into it. So uh, once again, uh, I am Stephen Witt, and this is Lauren. And we will be doing more of these episodes. Uh, if you are listening on the podcast, like I said, Invasive Wit on YouTube, I. Did a couple of Twitch things, but I don't right now. I'm not doing much on Twitch. That might change in the future. Who knows? But, but also invasive wit on Twitch. Yep, invasive wit on Twitch, and I'm also doing. Uh, going to start doing TikTok. Which, Lord help us. <laughs> thank you for that ringing endorsement, honey. Okay, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye. Should we uh, stop the stop the recording now? But but what about the bloopers? We don't, we don't have any bloopers. Oh, this can be introduced in the blooper. There you go.
that not good? Takes you? Okay. 